designed to fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all our Pioneer Fan Club members who are joining us on this HIP webinar today. This is the 13th HIP webinar we've had on this platform, and today's title is Revision Hip Arthroplasty. We're very grateful for this collaboration between the SICOT HIP Committee uh, and the Asia Pacific HIP Society. I'm Gauri Santhevendran, I'm the SICOT Education Academy Chair, and I welcome you to this webinar. Today's webinar is going to be moderated by Professors Abby Allens and Dr. Mrinal Sharma. Mrinal is head of orthopedics department at Amrita Hospital in Faridabad, India. And he's also a committee member of the SICOP Hip Arthroplasty uh, Committee, as well as the SICOP Educational Day Committee. Professor Allens is a consultant revision hip and knee replacement surgeon at the Subharati Institute of Medical Sciences in Meerut, India, as well as Professor for Orthopedics at Ames, Jodhpur, India. He's also an exec committee member, the Indian Arthroplasty Association. This is the 13th webinar, as I said, the last one garnering over a thousand viewers, both on demand and live. And up to date, we've had just under 100,000 people view our Pioneer webinars. And I think this will just add cake, icing to the cake. Without further ado, I welcome you once again to this HIP webinar. Please participate, post your comments in the discussion box, and the moderators will entertain the questions, both in terms of a live discussion, as well as a direct answer in the chat box towards the end. And on that note, over to you, the moderators. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gaur. And I'm grateful to Oliver and Dr. Noor for having collaborated this uh, combined webinar on revision total hip arthroplasty. Oliver, um, we'd like to start part A on the established side of revisions. And uh, without wasting much time, I think we would go to the first talk by Dr. Rehan Bull on quantifying established effects in revision total hip arthroplasty. Over to you, Dr. Rehan. Dr. Rehan, can you hear us? Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Um, thank you for the invite from CCOT and the Asia Pacific Hip Society. Uh, my name is Rehan Gul. I'm an orthopedic consultant in 
Cork University Hospital in Ireland. Um, if you're not familiar with Ireland, it's a little bit west of UK and Cork is very south of Ireland. Um, so I'm going to start with my presentation on quantifying the acetabular defects. Uh, in a revision hip surgery, we're all aware of the acetabulum. We are all aware of the Latournal and Jude's work on column theories on acetabulum. We all know about the columns. We know about the walls and different structures in the acetabulum, which is very important when you're describing anything. Now, why do we need to quantify defects? First thing, it'll alert you that you need to deal what you need to deal with and you can plan your operation, you can plan your implants. And if you need any further special implants that can help you with reconstruction, uh, that will be available to you as well. So that's a whole purpose of quantifying a defect. Now, the classification systems that we use, the most common one that I use, which is very simple, is American Academy's classification. It divides into four groups. So first one is a cavity defect where they're, all the rim of the estabulum is intact, so walls, anterior, posterior, superior, but just there's a big cavity in the estabulum. The second one is a segmental defect where one of the walls or two, three of the walls are missing. Um, that will be classified as a segmental defect. The third one is a combined cavitary segmental defect. And the fourth one would be a pelvic discontinuity which where the two parts of the pelvis doesn't connect to each other. So it goes with the severity. The other familiar classification is a Paprosky. Uh, Paprosky divided into three types. Again, type two is divided into three and type three into two. Paprosky talks about few structures. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. So it talks about how far the femoral head has migrated. If the ileoscale line or Kohler's line is intact, he talked about the teardrop and a uh, shell osteolysis. So the two pictures that I put it on the side. Um, it's just start from a severe migration of a head less than two centimeters. There's a ischial uh, osteolysis. The teardrop is good and the ileoscale line, collars lines and intact compared to the other one where you can see it has significantly migrated. There's no ileoscale line visible. The teardrop is gone and there's osteolysis in this scheme. Um, so all the all these classifications help us to look at a defect and decide what we want to do in terms of reconstruction. There is a third classification that I picked up recently. I don't think it's any different, but just thought I uh, might put it up if somebody might be interested. But they talk about various defect and reconstruction options for them. But I think it varies with surgeon to surgeon, and it depends on your training and how comfortable you are in managing defect. But it roughly gives you a guide as to what kind of implants you can use in various defect. And it's recently published in 2020. Now, just going for a few x-rays here. So I've already mentioned, you can see there is a polyecentric polyvere. The cup is solid. The ileoscale line is good. There is a scale lysis. Uh, so it's kind of uh, more segment, early defects. Uh, Paprosky 1, um, this is another one where you can see there is a bit of a scale lysis, nothing significant. Going to the next level where you can see the cup is definitely loose. There is a migration of over two centimeters. The ileoscale line is still visible. There is no teardrop. There is scale lysis. So somewhere in grade 3A to the other slide would be 3B where it's a superior significant migration uh, with significant bone defects. So idea of quantifying is to have a plan in your mind on a paper and you need to have your plan A, B, and C, so you can you will have no problems when you're doing revisions. Just another one where you can see there's a whole segment of the medial wall missing, more of a pelvic discontinuity, um, and more severe grades of it. Now, some hips, I find them very difficult to qu quantify, like this one. 
there is a medial wall, but there's no segments I can see, the roof is gone, and there's no cavity. So essentially, it's a flat acid abdomen. So sometimes it's hard to classify them too or quantify them, so just be prepared. Uh, for investigation, how to quantify them, plain x-rays are still good. Uh, due day views are recommended by a lot of surgeons, but I find a CT scan more helpful. It's done. You do get your three D pictures. You get decent. Uh, you get decent X ray, uh, decent pictures with metal suppression CTs, and you can look it up all around. You can even plan your implants if you have certain implants. You can plan those out in a CT scan. So I don't do Jude views. I do X rays and a CT scan. Most likely metal suppression CT scan. Uh, at the end. Uh, why do we quantify the defects? One thing is to know what defects we need to deal with. And so we can plan our operation and it helps us to look into various options that are available in your inventory. And be prepared that once you take out the cup, which may be a fixed one, your defects might change than what you saw on x-ray. So be prepared for it as well. Uh, thank you. I hope I stick to the time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rehan. Um, I think uh, we'll now stick to the time and go to the second talk. Oliver is going to actually introduce uh, the webinar as well as his discussion from his talk. Um, over to Oliver from Spain, and he's also the head of uh, our CICOT hip committee and a great Thank leader you. as well. Thank he's you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Mirna, for your great uh, presentation. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank to the society who is sharing this webinar with us, with the CICOT Hip Committee. And as a chair, I would like to thank uh, uh, Asia Pacific Hip Society for this uh, uh, webinar with us and trying to share the knowledge to Asia and Asia Pacific area. So my talk today, my six minutes, will uh, be focused in impact on bone grafting in the acetabular side. These are my disclosure that do not affect the following presentation. So if we want to restore the acetabular bone stock, I have been mentioned for the previous speaker, uh, we can use metal, as you have seen in this picture, versus use bone. So if you lose bone, you put bone in, not metal. That's one of the main principles here. And then there are several uh, ways to restore the bone. There are some publications that talk about uncemented caps that put this uh, bone at the back and then put some metal on it, uncemented metal. And this is one way. And it has been mentioned in the literature as impaction grafting technique. But the real impaction technique in bone grafting, impaction technique, have been described by Thomas Sloof from the, the Netherlands, from the Nimeja. And he has been mentioned with uncemented caps. So this is the technique. You use a special tools, like you can see in the pictures. You try to template the defect with this trial. Then you have to put a mesh, usually in this superior defect that you have been mentioned in the previous talk. You have to fix this uh, mesh with the screws with a distance of one centimeter between each one, as you can see in the picture. And then you can also use another mesh in the medial side or the anterior side. What happened with the graft? There are some controversies with that. Some people take the graft like you have, like you have seen here. This is a milling. This is with the uh, with, with the, this uh, very, very thin uh, graft. But the real graft described by Slough is with the ranger. You take the ranger and not the rimmer, you get these pieces of bone between 5 and 10 millimeters. Then you have to lavash this bone, and sometimes you, can, you have to use some antibiotic there. This is the original one, the original technique, but some people now combine with some bone substitutes or all the things that we will see during the presentation. So after that, you put the graft, the initial impaction grafting is, is with the small impactors, 
and you try to fill in the cyst and the periphery. You put the graft there, fill in the cyst and the, this area, small content area. And then you continue with bigger impactors and more graft inside, trying to do like a very strong and a stable structure. You may know that at least five millimeters thick of this layer should be done. And you have to get this space for the liner, the uncemented liner with a cement mantle between six and 10 millimeters. This is a tabular trial that sometimes you have to use to measure the, the, the defect at the beginning. But this is the structure that you can see after inserting the polyethylene. With this mesh superior, cement, and the line. But there are some description in the literature actually using this kind of trabecular uh, metal or porous metal augments just to reduce the bone graft that you need. These are different articles that mention good results, good short term results with this new structure. But the original one with uncemented and meshes and, and a liner, political liner, have a very good long term outcomes with these moderate defects, especially in very young patients. That's important. These people, as you can see in this paper, is uh, the perfect indication because you get the bone stock in the future. This is a summary of what you do defect, trial superior mesh with the screws, bone graft, initial impaction grafting, strong impaction grafting, polyethylene cemented in this area. There are some poor survival rates with big defects, and for sure it's a very demanding and need experience from the surgeon, but we get bone formation in the future. Finally, I will show you this case. It was the a septic loosening with a problem with instability. It's a dissociation of the acetabulum with a plate there. These are superior and medial meshes, bone graft, liner cemented, and we have a problem. It was an infection at six years. But look at that. When we remove that, this is the bone. It's a very stable and strong structure in the back of this patient. So in conclusions, we must say that we have good long-term results with this technique, remember, and cemented impaction grafting, and we keep bone stock, like you can see here, two months and three years. And finally, the next surgery, the next revision surgery in, in these young patients will be better and easier. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Oliver for the wonderful presentation. And uh, I do have a few questions for you, but we'll move on to the next uh, talk by Louis P. K. Chan on uh, cup cage construct and revision total hip arthroplasty. Over to you, Louis. So thank you. So perfect discontinu discontinuity is the distinct entity. It is defined by the dissociations of the posmo and distal half of the astabum. It's a distinct entity and I, I think in general, it's more common in Parposky 2C and 3AB to have a, this kind of pelvic discontinuity. The first important thing is to identify what is pelvic discontinuity. So this in the X-ray showed the key features of pelvic discontinuity, including a visible fracture line through the ileal ischial line, uh, medializations of the inferior hemipelvis, and change in the rotation alignment between the superior and inferior hemipelvis. As you can see, the, there's an asymmetry of the obturator foramen on both sides. Some of the basics of the pelvic discontinuity, in general, the instance can be one to five percent. There's are some patients have a high risk for pelvic discontinuity, including female sex, rheumatoid arthritis, and history of radiation therapy. In general, the causes can be divided into acute pelvic discontinuity or chronic pelvic discontinuity. The acute one is mostly hydrogenic, is due to the too aggressive rimming or impressions of the cup, 
but the chronic one is mostly likely due to the osteolysis or infections. So as discussed, acute or chronic. So for the acute, you can manage by plating, put in a cup, but for chronic pelvic discontinuity, because of the lack of the healing potential between the, the site of discontinuity, you need to have a various reconstruction techniques as shown here. Today, I'm going to concentrate on the cup cage techniques. So the principle of cup cage management, two important principles, you need to have a stable, durable, as strong component fixations. And the second, you need to unify, unitize the hemi pelvics at the site of discontinuity. Some of the technical tips for the cup case construct. First, before you put in anything, you need to have good exposure and then to identify the pelvic discontinuity. You can try to have a distractor to distract up the discontinuity site to confirm it intraoperatively. And then the next thing, you need to debride the tissue around there, the ex especially the scar tissue, and then pat in the allograph. You can have the femoral head allograph to pat in at the site of the discontinuity. And then you put in, have a reaming, and then, and, and then, and, and then to have a beating bone at the bone base and they put in a trabecular metal revision cup. You need to maximize the cup stability by achieving as much pass width as you can and then enhance the primary stability of the cup by putting in transversal screw. You can put in item screw, but more important also, you put in an inferior screw over the east gem or pubic remind to enhance the cup stability. Sometimes you need to put in a metal almond to enhance the cup stability especially you have a defect superiority. For the cup positions, most of the time, you need to put the cup in a more vertical and vertical vertical positions in order to leave space for the fence, for the, for the fence of the case you, you put in. For the cage itself, the aim is to offload the cup so that the cup heal to the whole bone and then beach the size of the discontinuity from ilium to ischium. For the ilium, there's ilium fence, you can put in the screw for the mechanical stability East screw fence, you need to put in a stock in order to put in East screw fence of the cage. And then you need unitize the TM cup to the cage with the cement. For the liner, you need to cement to the cage. And then the liner positions can be adjusted to achieve the maximum hip stability. So this is uh, Professor Allen's Gross series. This is one of the, the, uh, the highest number of cup cage. So you can see the survival ship is excellent, 10 years. 55% survivals. So here is a case of cut cage construct managed in my center, osteolysis, massive osteolysis, and then we saw in pelvic discontinuity. So we we'll put in a TM cup and then cage and then cement and lying in. This is 10 year follow up. We have a good cup stability and you can see the healing across the size of pelvic discontinuity. So are there any new techniques for the cup cage? The male clinic proposed a half cup cage technique. You can see the cage, the east skin fence was cut away. And then they compared a series of full cup cage and half cup cage. They saw both excellent survival ship and clinical outcomes. But the case for the case managed by half cup cage, there's a fewer instances of complications like the sarticular palsy because you don't need to dissect the east skin to be put in the east skin fence. So this is the x-ray show in the series cut the East Coast French and then put also more important, you need to have a better cup stability by putting it the inferior screw as shown here. So this is a case of half cup cage managed in my center. This total heat was done by the Asian country. And then we saw because of the poor polyethylene, it result in massive osteolysis. You can see a fashion line over the the uh, forward or the stabnums. So here, I cut the east skin flash. You need to have a good this bird to burr, to, drill, then to cut away the ECU flash. And then for the TM cup, you need to print in phase school. Four year follow up, as so here, there's a, you, the perfect discontinuity. It, there's a healing across the perfect discontinuity, and there's a good stability of the cup. So, in summary, the perfect discontinuity is a challenging condition. You can manage it by the full cup case construct. You have best report result and long, longer follow-up. There's also a half cup case test as reported by Mayo Clinic. It also show a good promising results. So with that, thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Luis. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, talk. And the next talk is Trabecular Metal Augments by Dr. Mehul Acharya. And uh, Sofian, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the CCOT APHS meeting on trabecular metal augments for large acetabular defects. I'm going to speak a, a little bit about the problem and some of the advantages of TMARS, uh, the mid and longer term evidence uh, for use of these implants in severe acetabular defects, and then illustrate this um, looking at a couple of cases. And so if we look at the severe end of the spectrum, um, the Proposki type 3As and type 3B uh, leading on to pelvic discontinuity, there are no real excellent uh, longer term options for dealing with these severe defects. The advantages of trabecular metal, um, as uh, some of you know, uh, the composition is very similar and akin to uh, normal bone in structure, function and physiology. Porosity is very high, which allows better in-growth, 75 to 80% uh, porosity. The interfacial frictional uh, coefficient is better than um, cancellous grafts and conventional metal implants. Um, and the modulus of elasticity is very similar to bone, again, allowing for better transfer of the stresses to the remaining bone. And this article here uh, was published a couple of years ago um, um, uh, from Ireland, um, and it looked at 38 cases of 3A and 3B defects, and it showed that they had a, a, a mean implant survivorship um, of up to nine years, and they found that of the implants that had survived, um, almost 94% of the augments remained well integrated, 97% of the acetabular components were well integrated. So let's just have a look Look at a couple of cases then. So this is a 76-year-old female with a few medical comorbidities, diverticulitis and diabetes, had a right total hip replacement in 2002, had some pain in her right hip in June 2011. This is an x-ray from August 2011, um, which shows that there's some eccentric polyethylene wear and some lysis around the acetabular component. So she went to, on to have a revision at another unit, um, and this was the immediate post-op um, uh, x-ray. You can see the drain is still in, um, and you can see it's been revised to a hybrid total hip replacement. Um, you can see that they've bone grafted the floor, but they've medialized the socket, and the socket is still medial to Kohler's line. This is it uh, a couple of months later, October 2011. You can see there's further migration of that socket medially. And then by January, two months later, so four months since the revision, the socket is almost half inside the pelvis. There's some broken metal work, uh, and we're really concerned about this. So she's referred up to me, um, we get some imaging, uh, which shows what we, we can already see on the x-rays. We can see that there's a, a risk of discontinuity here uh, with this scan. Again, further scans to highlight uh, uh, the, the intrapelvic cup uh, and the significant defect. So these were my thoughts. It was Broski type 3B defect with probable discontinuity, and I made up my plan. And this was my plan. So um, make sure there wasn't any infection. I was going to do an extended posterior approach, remove the components, and then true enough, there was a pelvic discontinuity. So what do I do next? Well, my plan for managing discontinuity is to attach the upper end of the pelvis to the lower end, and I usually use plates and uh, screws, and then I convert it to uh, a 3B defect and then manage the 3B defect. So in this particular case, uh, two plates uh, to compress uh, the discontinuity together, and then two atropecular metal augments cemented together um, into the floor, and then another um, a trabecular metal cup over the top of all of that. These are the initial post-op x-rays and you can see um, the two cups stacked on top of each other and the plates and screws. And this is her nine years post-op, mobilizing without any walking aids, doing pretty well. 
Just a second case to highlight a, a slightly different way of reconstruction. So this is a 71 year old female, um, left hip arthritis, went on to have a left uh, total hip replacement. And again, these are the early post-op images. So you can see that they've had an intraoperative fracture, um, a, a fracture of the posterior column. The cup is medialized again. Two months later, this is how it ends up. So the hip has migrated significantly superiorly. The cup of, has become intrapelvic and that whole posterior column is rotated out. Some Jude views again showing the chronicity of the, of the problem and the defect. And so when she comes to me, um, she's got a sciatic nerve palsy, which was existing from the operation. She's got an iliac vein DVT and the iliac vessels on contrast CT are stuck to the cup. So the options here are either number one, leave it well alone. For me, think about reconstructing or reducing that posterior column, but it, you've got to understand it's two or three months down the line. Think about osteotomies to try and bring that posterior column back round, or think of ways that you can recreate or reconstruct a posterior column. And that's what I did. So I left the cup inside you. I recreated a posterior column with the, uh, uh, the buttress augments and then put in a, a T-Mars type shell. And this is her immediate post-op images. And you can see that uh, we've restored some of her length and her offset in comparison to before. And this is her eight years post-op. So in summary, TMARS is an extremely versatile um, uh, bit of kit and can provide a very good mid to longer term results in severe acetabular defects. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Great talk from Dr. Mehul. Uh, thank you for the wonderful cases. Uh, we'll have the questions at the end. We would like to invite the audience to send questions on the chat box so that we can ask our faculty. And over to Dr. Shahid Noor, uh, sir, who is the president of Asia Pacific Hip Society for his next talk on customized cups and 3D printed cups in revision total hypothoplasty. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, a close academic collaboration between Asia Pacific Hip Society and Seacord Pioneer. Uh, I'm Professor Shahid Noor. I'm the president of Asia Pacific Hip Society. And today I'm going to share my experience of uh, dealing with 3D custom made tri flange cup in difficult situation. So, revision total hip arthroplasty is on the rise universally according to national registry data. The survival of revision total hip arthroplasty is significantly lower than primary total hip arthroplasty. And this failure rises exponentially in re revision and multiple re revision. Acetabular bone loss of 3B and pelvic discontinuity present a reconstructive challenge for arthroplasty surgeon. I'm going to present few cases of 3B and pelvic discontinuity. A uh, few of my previous speakers have shown different ways. So there are obviously more than one way of dealing with a problem, and it depends on your surgical experience, availability of implant, and how to use it effectively. So... Uh, Quickly jumping into the case, a 55 years old known case of rheumatoid arthritis presented in 2019. She had her primary uncemented total hip replacement in uh, 2007. And she came to, uh, on 2016, she had her first revision. And in 2019, she had a failure and presented with pain. So this is 2007. She had an uncemented acetabular and femoral component. And by 2016, she had massive loosening, and this is Peprosky uh, 3B. 2016, she underwent revision somewhere else, and this was impaction bone grafting, a dual mobility cup. But she had a significant early failure. So revision does not mean that it is going to last. And the revision has to be done perfectly. And this is clearly 3B in pelvic discontinuity. And this is her right uh, lateral view of the acetabulum. And this was the first case. It was challenging. We discussed in, in, in different group and we opted for a custom tri -flan. So a 3D CT scan was sent and this is the trial and placement, the center of rotation. And this is the implant design tri -flan in the ileum ischium and pubis. These are intraoperative picture where after removal of a stabler component, uh, impaction bone grafting. This is the trial hemipelvis in the trial implant. And these are um, allograft from the femoral head, impaction bone grafting. 
and this is the pelvic and uh, lateral view of the real implant and trabecular metal bar. Impaction bone grafting and the implant uh, put in and finally the trabecular metal bar is placed in the sciatic buttress which is the strongest part of the ilium. It provides immediate stability and later on further secondary stability. And on top of that, we have put a dual mobility liner cup. So these are post-operative x-rays in thick month time and 12 month time. The medial bone graft has been very well taken. It's a proper uh, tri-flange cup in the ilium and ischium and trabecular metal bar. Another case, a 52 years old, morbidly obese patient in 1987 when she was 17 years old, she had stage primary total hip replacement. In year 2000, 13 years post for a primary event, she had both her hip stage revised. And 2011, she had second revision of both hip stage first left and then right. 2020, she presented to us with increasing pain in her uh, left hip. And you can see clearly the cub cage, uh, the cemented cage is completely displaced superiorly and laterally, 3B and pelvic discontinuity and a well-fixed long cemented implant. So again, uh, we plan for a custom tri-flange cup and these are the designing of the CT scan, the frontal and the lateral view. This is the placement of center of rotation. This is the, the plant cup uh, inclination and uh, antiversion. And these are the trial plan where to put the trabecular metal bar. This is trial pelvis uh, component and the trial implant. And this is impaction bone grafting and placement of the trial implant. And this is the real implant, both uh, the pelvic view and the lateral view and trabecular metal bar. And this is press in dual mobility liner. Intraoperative pictures or placement of implant after impaction bone grafting. And this is after dual mobility placement. These are post-operative x-rays in three months time and uh, two years time. You can clearly see that the medial bone graft has very well taken. There's a good fixation on the ileum, ischium and on the pubic side. The female component is restored. Another patient, 62 years old, uh, female patient in 2004 had uh, for fracture neck of femur, canalated hip screw, non-union implant failure. In 2007, left, left cemented total hip replacement was done. 2017, she came with uh, increasing pain in her hip. And this is how she presented massive bone lysis displacement of the acetabular component. This is clearly 3B. And you can see osteolysis in the ischium. And clearly, there are ways, uh, more than one way, impaction bone grafting. But we thought of doing a, a custom tri-flange cup. Um, so these are intraoperative picture, extended trochanteric osteotomy for removal of femoral component, impaction bone grafting, trial implant. This is the uh, pelvic and the lateral view of the implant, and this is placement of cup. And this is the uh, press fit liner of the dual mobility cup. And the femur was significantly uh, bone lysis, so we opted for proximal femur replacement. These are post-operative x-rays. Uh, you can see clearly that the medial bone graft has been very well taken. The ileal wing has multiple screws and on the ischium as well, we have put bone grafting. The proximal femur has been replaced with the proximal femur replacement. You can see the post-operative and pre-operative x-rays, the pre-operative and post-operative lateral view. The last case of a 72-year-old male, primary total hip replacement cemented was done in 1998. 2009, he had his first revision with cage, impaction bone grafting, and long cemented implant. 2020, he presented with increasing pain in his uh, hip, 3B acetabular bone loss, and 3B femoral bone loss. So this is the right hip. You can see clearly the up and in uh, bone loss. And if you see the femur, there is clearly bone loss all the way on the diaphysis 3B. So we opted for a custom tie flying cup. This is the lateral view, frontal view, and inferior view. This is the uh, approved uh, trial implant with uh, seven screws on the ileum, two in the ischium, and in the pubis, in addition to the trabecular metal bar. These are intraoperative pictures of the removal of uh, cemented component and cage massive bone uh, loss. Uh, this is trial pelvic component and the trial implant and the real implant, the pelvic and the lateral view and trabecular metal bar. These are intraoperative pictures after impaction bone grafting and the femur was reconstructed with proximal femur replacement. 
You can clearly see here that the medial wall is very well, the bone broth is very well incorporated. The trapecular metal bar in the, is in the sciatic bed press. And the screws, both in the ileum and the ischium, are very well taken. And these are preoperative and postoperative x rays. And the femur, and he is five years down the line and doing pretty good. So, in conclusion, revision in arthroplasty for acetabular bone loss and pelvic discontinuity is a challenge and can be managed in various ways. And my previous speakers have managed that we have shown uh, the management with uh, uh, predictability, the 3D custom triflange uncemented acetabular cup with a trabecular metal surface. This location rate has been significantly reduced uh, with the addition of dual mobility. In our short series of 10 patients, we have had zero dislocation and we have zero failure of fixation. The key to this success is preoperative planning, impaction bone grafting with allograft, uh, immediate stability they achieve with maximum host bone contact of implant, multiple screws in the ileum, ischium, and pubis, trabecular metal bar placed in the sciatic buttress part of the ileum act as a strong pillar giving immediate stability and secondary stability is achieved by boning in growth on the trabecular metal surface. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Noor. And we'll take questions in the end. We'll go back, go to our distraction technique case presentation by Dr. Krishna Kiran. And uh, he'll be presenting his case and describing us the technique. Over to you, Dr. Kiran from India. Now you're muted. So can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you now, but we have not heard uh, earlier. Yeah. So uh, my brief is to talk about distraction and I was just thanking the organizers for the opportunity. So this is a 47 year old man uh, who underwent open reduction and internal fixation for associated both column acetabular fracture about a year back. And he presented to us like this with uh, elevated ESR and CRP and uh, he was in a polytrauma and he obviously had an infected uh, situation. So we uh, removed the uh, we removed the uh, plates, did a 3D planning and did a two-stage reconstruction using a trabecular metal augment and a, a trabecular metal cup. And uh, this was done in 2014. And about a year, he did well. And after a year, he had an abduction failure of the uh, uh, implant. And we went ahead and went and did a, a cup cage reconstruction at that point in time. And interoperatively, the cultures grew pseudomonas. So probably he had a septic situation. And his uh, inflammatory parameters were uh, uh, not very elevated for us to suspect infection. And there was no frank pus discharge. So this cup cage construct did well for seven years. And then he represented to us uh, in 2021 with uh, uh, 22 with reinfection of this entire construct with elevated ESR, CRP and pus discharge. And we did a, a removal of this uh, particular situation and this particular case pertains to the reconstruction uh, following the uh, first stage of uh, septic reconstruction for this particular case. If you look at the CT scan here, we noticed interoperatively as well was, uh, was that there was uh, pelvic discontinuity in this case which was now a chronic pelvic discontinuity and uh, all the three fragments were separate from each other. Now, chronic pelvic discontinuity usually, as was told before, is associated with the 3A, 3B and sometimes 2C defects. It can be acute or chronic and it has got questionable healing potential. You have disruption of anterior and posterior columns with no continuity between ileum, ischium and pubis. And there is always uh, uh, more than three centimeters proximal migration of hip with less than 50% of post bone contact in many of these cases. And how to recognize has been well illustrated previously. You have several options. Uh, you have the structural allograph plating with highly porous hemispherical socket. Distraction technique as I'm going to show you. You can use a custom triflange, a cage with cemented cup or a cup cage construct. Now the principles of uh, distraction technique is it doesn't use additional cages for the uh, reconstruction, just uses TM augments with the trabecular metal shell, but we must not uh, destabilize the discontinuity with overzealous de debridement. We must define and bone graph the discontinuity. We must determine and uh, the location and function of the TM augment. 
we must determine the two point fixation position of the establer reamer to get the ideal socket size for that patient to avoid undersizing and usually we use a cup which is 4 mm larger than the first two point contact determined between the residual anterior superior and posterior inferior parts of the establer inferior fixation plays an important role in optimizing the success for these particular cases it is called as kickstand fixation into the superior pubic ramus and ischium so we can use uh, devices like this with shan pins or steam and pins into the ilium and ischium to achieve controlled distraction to avoid neurovascular compromise and over distracting the establum so that was what was done we used a tm augment first as a pri for primary stability reamed between the tm augment and the remaining inferior host bone and then used a trabecular metal revision shell with the metal ring which was removed and the shell was unitized to the augment with cement and we fixed the shell inferiorly into the superior pubic ramus and ischium and as was pointed out before cemented a dual mobility liner into it and that's the immediate post operative x ray showing re uh, reconstitution of this particular defect with the tm augment and the distraction technique and that's the uh, one year follow up showing good in integration of the uh, socket and healing of the discontinuity so currently this is the technique which we follow and we feel that distraction technique is a reliable option for chronic pelvic discontinuity the tm augment function must be determined usually if you have intracavitary defects it must be put in first and must be used for primary stability then we must assess the residual host bone contact and the two point sizing between the remaining anterior superior and posterior inferior parts must be determined and inferior fixation is important for achieving the initial stability as is cement unitization with the augment and usually we use a cemented dual mobility into these uh, sh revision shells to decrease the risk of instability thank you thank you dr kiran we will have some questions uh, from the faculty so first question probably i like to ask oliver when would you choose between a cemented cup and an uncemented cup in uh, you know impaction bone grafting Uh, thank you for the question, Mirna. Uh, the main problem is when you use uncemented, this is not an impaction grafting technique. It's a grafting technique. Uh, the real impaction, as I have mentioned in my presentation, is to get a very stable structure only with the graft. So it has been mentioned in several presentations here, talking about impaction grafting, but this is not impaction grafting. This is grafting some with uncemented. Cups. Is so, it mandatory to use a mesh every time we do impaction grafting? Not really. You have to get a stable structure with the graft. Sometimes you need a anterior superior mesh. Sometimes you can get this stability with only the graft. But uh, this is a very important co concept. Use uncemented cups in a very stable graft with this size, one millim ten millimeters of the of this every chip of this uh, bone graft. Okay, so the next question probably I like to ask is from uh, Dr. Lewis and uh, Dr. Shahid Noor also. When would you choose between a cup cage construct and uh, maybe jump off to three D printed cup? When would you say that a cup cage construct will not work in this case? So any of you can answer. Okay, yeah. uh, I think uh, Marinal, uh, just for the audience all around the world, there are more than one way of dealing with the problem, and your decision will depend on your training. Availability of technique and Oliver has shown a very good uh, presentation. But this is a very labor-intensive technique, and you need to have the cages available. These are not available all around the world, and it is a dying skill. And I think it is the responsibility of Asia Pacific Hip Society and the hip section of the C Corp to reinvent impaction bone grafting technique, as has been shown in the Exeter. Now, uh, I have shown some cases of custom uh, trifling. Uh, Oliver has shown impaction bone grafting, and uh, another of the colleague have shown uh, trabecular metal augment as well as a distraction technique. All these are going to work if you have had training under experienced person, and then you have performed. It is not an easy job that you've listened to a webinar and next day you do that. I mean, let me say something about that. I completely agree with you. I mean, uh, the problem is how you call that. 
Uh, because when you're comparing the literature to impact on brown grafting results at 15 years, maybe some people is talking about unsemantic caps, another people is talking about aumens, another people is about Exeter technique, I mean, Nimega, Sloof technique. So this is important to mention, what do you do? I mean, I agree with you. You have to do it in the best way you have, you know how to do it and get good results. But if you talk about impact on grafting technique, you have to talk about the Sloof technique. I would add one more thing that impaction bone grafting is not supported by the industry. The industry is going to support custom triflang. The industry is going to have seminar and send you abroad for treble care metal augment and cages. But this is something that is very relevant to Asia Pacific region where people and patient cannot afford. But then you need the training. You've very clearly mention Oliver that this is not bone grafting this is converting an open area into a contained area and then have a solid wall of impaction bone grafting and then putting a cemented gate. Uh, Satesh? Sorry I agree uh, unfortunately impaction grafting is a dying art and it seriously needs to be revived uh, because uh, poor countries can't afford so much metal uh, and I think there are, um, uh, I think something should be done to get that re re reinvigorated. How is a very difficult question because uh, even from Exeter, from my understanding, they have gone away from the the large meshes that hold the bone graft because they have they have shown failures from there and they have moved on. The other option is to add an augment as the as you have shown in some of the talks with bone grafting. So it's a, it's an art that needs to be uh, that needs to be brought back into the fore, reinvented. Louis, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think uh, all the techniques mentions are all technical demanding techniques. Don't just uh, uh, listen to the webinar and try one. You need to follow a master to watch a surgery and probably do it together with a master. All the techniques mentions are all technical demanding techniques. So I agree that uh, bone graft, so apart from the graft of readability, the technique is also important. So Kiran, last question to you probably. Uh, when would you say that probably this, this uh, distraction technique is not going to work in this case? So what are the contraindications the, actually for that? The, the, the issue is uh, with the Indian patients, the minimum size which you need to do a cup cage is around 62 and you know that uh, the Indian men have a 52 standard socket and uh, women have around 44 or 46. So it's very uncommon for us to see 66, 67 to put in a cup cage. So out of necessity, I started the distraction technique, but I would not do it if the residual host bone contact is less than 30%. Then that probably is an indication to go for a custom triflange as uh, Dr. Shahid has so elegantly presented. So if your residual host bone contact is more than 30 uh, uh, inferiorly, and then you can add a little bit of contact with the TM augment superiorly, then I would be comfortable doing the distraction technique. But if it is less than 30% host bone, then you have to look at alternative options. Maybe the impaction bone grafting, but I think availability of uh, bone graft uh, is a challenge because all of the uh, uh, people in Asia do not have the access to bone banks which are standardized. and then. The technique itself is very labor intensive. It works very well for cavity defects, but for segmental defects, if you look at literature as well, the failure rate is slightly higher. And if you don't do it properly, you don't have access to adequate bone graft, then impaction grafting can be a very difficult thing to uh, do in our setups as well. Yeah, Mirna, there is a question from the audience uh, and we have more than 100 people connected actually. Uh, can you say this question? Yeah, how, uh, how the question is, how do you quantify migration of head when the stabler component is loose? What is the reference point to start the measurement? So anyone wants to take it? You can uh, take the uh, teardrop level and see where the center is. And if it is more than three centimeters above the level of the uh, teardrop, or you can take the opposite hip center. And if it is two centimeters more than the opposite uh, hip center, then again, uh, you're looking at a higher grade as tabular defect. But if it is less than two centimeters from the contralateral hip center or less than three centimeters from the teardrop, then we are not looking at a very high grade defect. I would like no volumetric measure. I think it's just the vertical distance which is uh, being measured from the teardrop 
or the I think Rehan did his talk. So I, 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 I would agree with Krishna that it's a center of the hip and then you measure it off. So I think my presentation had a cup with a poly wear. Uh, but problem is very high grade. It's very hard to measure because you have no anatomy. So ischial line, ischium is always there most of the time. So if you draw a line through the skim and measure up your standard hip with the worn out hip, it'll give you a fair idea. But it's just a number. I don't think it makes any difference. It just tells you how bad your acetabulum is going to be. Okay, I think uh, we are short of time now. We'll switch over to part B, the revision of the femoral stems. And over to Abhay. Thank you very much, Manal, and a great established site. So without wasting much time, uh, we have an excellent faculty with high volume surgeons from, uh, from UK, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from Kuala Lumpur, Turkey, and from India. So without wasting time, I would like uh, the first talk from Dr. Satish Kutti from Harlow, and his brief is to talk on quantifying femur defects. Thank you, Abey. Um, just going to share my screen. Um, one second. Yeah, thank you, Abey, and thank you to Seacott and Asia Pacific Hip Society for the invite. Uh, my remit is to talk about quantifying femoral defects. Uh, as you can see, the from our National Joint Registry data uh, from last year, you, you can clearly see the amount of revision has been going up. Uh, and uh, uh, the key was in 2012, there was a big spike, and this was related to the large metal and metal revision workload that we had to undertake. But that has now gradually subsided, uh, but it would be interesting to see that just after the pandemic, the workload has significantly reduced. But my assumption is this is because of the pandemic and the COVID-related issues, but that's slowly going up. Uh, so why is quantifying defects so, so important and, and uh, necessary? Our primary hip replacement workload is ever increasing and the volume is just going up and up. Patients are living longer. Our revision burden is therefore increasing significantly. And revision, as we all know, is a challenging procedure. And that's why we have webinars like this to learn from each other. And therefore planning of, of revision is, uh, is extremely important. And we need uh, to understand the problems or the defects that are there. And therefore, as Rehan's uh, talk was on classification of established defects, similar classification of the femoral side is also very important and useful. Uh, there are various classification systems. Uh, as with the established side, there is the American Academy one, then there is the Petrosky one, uh, and there are other newer ones which people are trying to uh, uh, latch on to, such as the femoral defects classification. So this is the American Academy one, and they have uh, uh, limited to uh, uh, segmental cavity, combined uh, ones, alignment, isthmus problems, and discontinuity. Uh, however, this has significant limitations, and this is essentially a classification after you've done uh, the after you've you have done the exposure, and then you come to a decision as to what to do. And therefore, it's not quantitative enough, and practical applications often quite limited with this classification from D'Antonio. The, the next one is the Petrovsky one, which we all know is very popular, and it's extremely useful in that regard because it it tells you exactly where the um, the bone losses, it tells you how much of bone loss and it defines how much of bone stock is remaining, which is absolutely key in deciding how you're going to reconstruct. And in that classification, what you should always remember is to find where the isthmus uh, is and how far away or close to it is your defect. And allows, I'll give, provides a significant uh, um, understanding of how to deal with these problems and therefore guidelines. So uh, moving on to the type one, which is um, uh, relatively easy uh, in terms of revision uh, uh, procedure, there's very little bone stock loss. As you can see from this x-ray, this patient has, has got a dual mobility uh, done in France, uh, and you can see it's a French technique with uh, very little cement, but he had huge uh, osteolysis around the proximal um, femur around the trochanter and the lesser trochanter. Uh, so the, uh, the rest of the bone was significantly intact and easy to revise. <laughs> Moving on to type two, this is um, uh, has been a majority of a workload uh, so far. There's significant metaphyseal damage, but the key is the diaphysis is intact. 
and therefore you can get very good fixation whatever mode you decide to choose. As you can see from this x-ray, the, the, the metaphysis is significantly thin and therefore the diaphysis, which appears pretty good, uh, does help with your uh, revision uh, procedure. In type 3, um, uh, not sure you can see the x-ray quite well, which is uh, relatively less, thankfully. The metadiaphyseal bone loss um, is the area of concern. So we need to know how much of uh, isthmus is left. If it's less than 5 centimeters, then it's satisfactory. We can good, get good fit. As soon as you go to less than 5, then your amount of fixation is going to be a problem, and therefore we have to be very careful. And the type 4 uh, is where you have um, significant metaphyseal diaphyseal problems. There's hardly any bone left all the way down, and you have a huge canal. So uh, this, to make it simplistic, the Peproski, you need to look at where your defect is. Is it upper third, mid third, or lower third? And then this, this mess, as you know, is located in the mid third, and that will significantly help you with how you're going to address fixation. The new one which people have been talking about is the femoral defects classification from, De from Denmark. So this identifies the location in the neck, the femoral metaphysis, both the greater and lesser trochanter, and then the diaphysis, the extent of damage is divided further into A, B, and C. So if you look at the one, which is very little around the neck, then we go into the, the metaphysal area where the greater and lesser trochanters are located, and significantly more destruction can be seen. And as you go with uh, three, eight, three and fours is three is uh, the diaphysis is intact and four the diaphysis is significantly damaged. Uh, this is supposed to be very reliable um, and it allows very good planning and uh, consistent pre-op guidance. So to finish off, uh, what I would like to say mm -hmm. off is quantifying femoral defects is extremely essential. So you need to know this because of pre-op planning. It's part of the process. It allows you to understand where you're going to have fixation and therefore implant strategies. It's also good for having uh, interoperative guidance as to what to do should you run into problems. And therefore, it's important to choose a system that is useful to your requirements. Thank you. Thank you. May I have the next speaker? And we have uh, Dr. Mojit talking on ETO, please. Dr. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Trying to get my uh, slides. Okay. So um, it's my pleasure to be talking about extended through country osteotomy, principles, indications, and technical pearls. Um, the talk will be divided into indication, planning, technique, and then fixation principles. So the indications of extended trochanteric osteotomy is basically infection of a uh, total hip arthroplasty, removal of a well-fixed cemented or cementless femoral component, or you can uh, use it to remove uh, cement after you have taken a cemented femoral component out. You can also use it to correct uh, proximal varus deformity uh, in a situation of a loose femoral component when you're planning um, revision total hip arthroplasty, and also prosthetic fracture, and in cases that you need improved acetabular exposure, like this case of an acetabular protrusion with a hemiarthroplasty. So uh, preoperative planning is of paramount importance in ETO, and in doing so, you got to plan for a length of an osteotomy that's at least 10 to 12 centimeters from the tip of the greater trochanter. But also in the meantime, you need to keep in your mind that you need to leave about four to six centimeters of diaphyseal isthmus to give you a scratch fit for your proposed revision implant that you'll be putting in. Uh, before you start with the osteotomy, it's always a good idea to put a distal circulage wire just distal to the end of your osteotomy to prevent any uh, fracture to uh, uh, propagate through the intact distal fragment. And also keep the edges round of the osteotomy limbs and be careful not to perforate and not to cause any undue fracture. The hip needs to be positioned in a flexion and interrotation of 30 degrees, assuming that this is done through the postural lateral approach. Although theoretically, these osteotomies could be done 
through a direct anterior and going from anterior media to postlateral, but the popular um, uh, one is to go from the postlateral approach. When you uh, identify the posterior limb of the osteotomy and plan it, you'll be going through the substance of the vastus lateralis, just anterior to the lateral intermuscular septum. In doing so, you got to be aware of any perforator and tie them immediately or use, a, or use a vascular clip. What you don't want is these perforators to retract and cause an undue bleeding. Remember to release anterior capsule and soft tissue that might hold the fra uh, osteotomy fragment and may cause fracture. Beware of the flare of the greater trochanter. That's the thinnest area and maybe a site of a fracture. Uh, if you are doing this to remove a um, uh, cemented femoral component, leave the cement on the osteotomy fragment, take it off just before the closure and not at the beginning of the procedure. Keep in your mind that the length of the osteotomy depends very much of the revision implant that you are having it in and the revision implant that you'll be putting it in. What's the length of the isthmus? And if do you have any osteolytic lesion? If do you have any cement mantle that you need to remove? If you look at the diagram on your right side, it shows you the bevel distal tip as well as the length of the osteotomy. This is a diagrammatic picture on a saw bone, and you can see that the length is designed to be at least 12 centimeters from the tip of the greater trochanter. The posterior limb of the osteotomy has been designed. And also on your right side, you can see this on the live uh, cadaveric dis uh, dissection. So you start your uh, your osteotomy with an uh, oscillating saw from the proximal part of the prox of the um, uh, GT going distally, and as you get close to the end of your distal um, uh, portion of your posterior limb, you take a pencil tip burr to make a rounded edge, and also make sure, as you can see here, that the edges are beveled. Assuming that, of course, you would have put a distal circular wire to protect. This is a diagrammatic picture showing how you can also make a dotted uh, drills. So you can make multiple holes by drill and connect them with your osteotomy saw if you want to make sure that you're coming at the right thickness of the uh, osteotomy fragment and also to stay above uh, or posterior to your implant in case your femoral implant has not been removed. This x-rays on your A and B side shows the length of the osteotomy that will include the majority of the length of the uh, femoral implant, whereas on the C and D, a far more shorter. This will uh, ensure that your uh, implant can come out with a cemented. In the uncemented variety, you can uh, basically use a metal cutting guide to cut from the proximal fragment and the rest of the rounded part of the distal fill of the implant could be taken out using a trephine. Um, this is a picture showing how you can use a drill guide to correct, connect your drill dots, both, whether this in the posterior limb or the anterior limb. Once the osteotomy is done and the, frag and the uh, implant is out, then you can go ahead and use the tap and the drill to take away your uh, cement mantle. Um, in terms of closure and fixation, um, what definitely has been proven that cable are far more better than circular edge wires. Circular edge wires are likely to produce non-union. Uh, when you're closing the osteotomy, make sure that you do not approximate, approximate the anterior part of the fragment because that might cause an impingement and the posterior dislocation. So always focus on approximation, the posterior limb, um, whether you use a cable claw or GTR plate versus the cable. Um, basically, the use of uh, GTR or claw cable plate are reserved for cable cases of uh, high risk that are either thin uh, bony fragment, you're suspecting non-union or you had a fracture. But if you didn't have any one of those, then using three or four cables is equally good. You don't need to use a GTR plate. This is a case example of a lady who had a rheumatoid arthritis and ended, ended up having a cemented total hip. Four years down the road, she came with a loose uh, total hip uh, component. Infection was ruled out. We used um, an extended trochanteric osteotomy, and you can see how the entire cement mantle could be removed. And this is a modular type of distal uh, fix uh, uh, fluted taper edge design and you can see that we have put a distal circlage at the, at the part of the distal fragment prior to commencing the osteotomy. The proximal um, uh, cable uh, was used to um, uh, close the osteotomy. The proximal most cable was drilled through the lesser trochanter to prevent the proximal migration. I do that by drilling the uh, lesser trochanter by 2.0 millimeter and then I drill uh, I use a 1.8 cable to go through uh, the, the drill hole. So, in conclusion, uh, extended trochanteric osteotomy is an excellent technique for removal of femoral component with or without the cement. Uh, with the pre-op planning is, is a mandatory uh, step to ensure success. And careful execution is to be done to avoid fracture. Fixation with the two or three cables are equally as good as a cable claw plate that should be reserved for the very high-risk cases, like that of fracture, thin bony fragment, or cases of non-union. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Majib, sir. Great talk. Uh, May I request Dr. Hazam for his talk on 
cement and cement revision. Can you unshare your uh, presentation, please, sir? Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Can you stop sharing your screen, please, the previous speaker? Yeah. Dr. Hazan? Uh, can you unmute you yourself, are... Dr. Hazan? Dr. Hazan, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, can you... Um, Not visible, you... sir? Yeah, okay. No. No. Uh, can you see the... Uh... Sure, yes, sir. First slide, oh. you need to put it on slideshow. Yes, that's sure. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon uh, or good morning or good evening. Uh, we are talking about cement and cement uh, revision. Cement and cement revision has been there for some time uh, since it was uh, first uh, described by uh, Iftikhar and then uh, validated by uh, Green uh, World. Um, it, is, it, it does need actually... Uh, uh, and understanding of the biomechanics um, to know what are the prerequisites for uh, uh, for that. Um, actually, an, an intact, uh, you need an intact bone uh, cement interface. So it is done mainly for uh, a re a revision when there is loosening at the stem uh, cement uh, interface. Uh, you need uh, an intact uh, cement uh, mantle below uh, the lesser uh, trochanter. And uh, it has actually uh, been shown that the uh, shear uh, and tensile uh, strength of the uh, cement uh, to cement, if done properly, is actually uh, as good as a, French, uh, a fresh uh, cement uh, block. But if you have contamination with blood or debris, uh, or a lot of uh, uh, so, uh, volume, fluid volume, then it really uh, is not a good uh, uh, technique and it does reduce the uh, strength by up to 85%. Uh, the uh, this, uh, the other thing which was proven biomechanically uh, that the uh, strength of the cement and cement if done properly is actually stronger than the cement to bone if you remove the original cement and you re-cement on the residual uh, industrial uh, uh, bone. You have to have a very uh, uh, clean uh, uh, surfaces. Uh, and you have also to introduce the cement in the liquid form and pressurize it in that form because this will give a better uh, 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 strength and also it allows for the uh, polymerization and the reaction between the polymer and the monomer, the residual monomer. Now, the indications, there is, uh, it's, it's mainly when you have uh, either you are going for, uh, you want to, to do uh, acetabular revision and you want to uh, uh, remove the stem for better exposure or, as I said, for uh, problems of the femoral uh, version or uh, loosening of the stem uh, and uh, periprosthetic uh, fracture. And it has been used also in infection. Now, I want to say something about the periprosthetic fracture. Of course, you have to be, to have all or the gear that you might need. You have to have a long stem. You, you might need uh, <coughs> actually uh, cables or plates, uh, uh, and uh, you will need, of course, uh, uh, the same principles uh, that you go on and a long uh, stem to bypass uh, the fracture by at least two uh, diameter. Uh, and in cases of actually uh, infection, uh, the recommendation is even if you're doing the uh, this technique in early infection or acute infection, uh, where the cement at the femoral side, uh, the bone cement is very intact, you also have to have an intact bone uh, uh, cement interface at the acetabular side, and you have to remove the acetabular uh, uh, change, actually, the um, uh, the uh, acetabular piece with another uh, one. And uh, I personally, if I do it, I, I am a two-stage 
uh, surgeon, so I do it uh, as even as a two stage. Now <clears throat> the technique itself, you you abort the technique if uh, uh, during surgery you found that your uh, 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 bone bo your uh, bone uh, cement interface is weak uh, or there is a soft tissue. Uh, you you abort the technique, but it, uh, if not, then you proceed. You remove the uh, stem at the shoulder, the cement at the shoulder of the uh, with burrs or osteotomes. Then you remove your uh, uh, implant and you take about two to three millimeter from the neck to give you better exposure of the cement uh, bone uh, interface. You test it. You uh, you can test it with uh, a forceps around here just to uh, try to to move it. Uh, there should be it should not move and there should be no uh, soft tissue uh, and then uh, if uh, needed uh, for version or for size you bear the uh, uh, acetabulum uh, sorry you bear the uh, femoral uh, uh, canal uh, you have to be very sure when you bear it not to overbear because you do need, uh, uh, you shouldn't go below two millimeter of cement. So the idea here is to give it just the amount of bearing which allows you to put the proper uh, side and to have a, like a rough surface because this will aid in polymerization and the reaction of the cement. And then so you put you the one minute left. Cement, yes, uh, then you put the cement in in uh, in the liquid form, pressurize it pressurize the stem and you have different sizes of stems that you can uh, uh, use. Uh, there is also actually uh, different uh, studies and uh, systematic reviews have shown a uh, good result. The survival, uh, uh, the overall survival as well as the survival for aseptic loosening and for stem failure is very high uh, uh, in the medium and the short term uh, 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 studies. So the learning point, uh, it is a valid option in revision total uh, hip. It has to be done by an expert uh, and uh, you should have an intact cement bone interface. Uh, do a pulse lavage and thorough drying and cleaning and you use the cement in a low viscosity and it may be used in highly, highly selective cases of infection. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Great talk. So we now move on to the next talk, impaction bone grafting of the femur. Is it a dead art or is it a need of the art? Uh, Dr. Chua. Okay. Um, thank you, Abe. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay, so I'm talking about femoral impaction bone grafting. Um, so I'm, I'm Hua Sen. I'm from Malaysia. So my, my talk will, will start off with an introduction and definition. We have rationale and indication for impaction bone grafting for femur. Uh, I'll have some techniques with videos uh, showing a little bit of clinical outcomes as well as conclusion. Uh, definition of infection bone grafting, just like what uh, Oliver has said, uh, it is essentially a vigorous infection of the bone chips into the bone defects. Uh, you do need to use the cemented component being in establum of femur. That is so that the load can be channeled through the cement uh, to the impacted bone graft. The rationale of impaction bone grafting, again, just like what Oliver has said, is where the bone is missing, you should replace it with the bone. And essentially, by doing impaction bone grafting, you restore the suitable environment for cement fixation, and you actually restore the bone stock for the patient for the potential next revision surgery and also to restore the anatomy for this particular patient. And last but not least, you restore the function through pain relief with an infection bone grafting. So in the indication, mainly for the femur side, uh, for the bone loss caused by aseptic loosening with the severe osteolysis, Poprosky 2, 3, and 4, uh, be it in the cemented stems or cementless stem. It could be for the septic loosening, post-stage 1 revision after the infection is under control, could also be used in periprosthetic fracture of Vancouver B3. So the revision with the bone impaction grafting, attention to the detail is for success is very, very important. 
first of all, you need to have a favorable host bed for the new bone graft to put on. Uh, the graft containment can be important. For the femur side, you may need some mesh and, and cables to make sure that you contain the graft. Uh, a good cancellous bone with the correct size for impaction, the vigorous impaction after that during the technique, a uh, cement pressurization, you do need to bypass the defect if you need be with a longer implant. For the technique, the first, after you, you have, you assess the, your, 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 your uh, bone defect, and then you see whether or not which uh, stem size is correct. Next is, of course, you need to have a plug, an end plug for the, for the, for the bone to end. You need to measure it into where it's supposed to be. It has to be, of course, longer than the intended stem that you need be. And um, after which you put in and you measure, and these are all the distal impactor. Again, you measure them as accordingly onto where it should stop uh, without blowing up the distal um, cortex of the femur. And um, that is again a video on how you measure them. And then the technique, obviously, you put in your bone graph and then you impact the distal bone uh, with the distal impactor as such. This is the video on how you put in bone graft and then you impact away by using the distal impactor. Okay. After you put in the distal impactor, uh, enough bone graft onto the distal impactor, the next is to create the shape for the proximal side of the femur by using the, the shape match impactor. And this is how it is by impacting it to create the shape. And from then, after you get the shape down to the correct uh, uh, depth, you will try and see whether or not this particular um, uh, stem, is it stable or not, okay? Before you then start to continue uh, to impact uh, the proximal part of the bone. So in the event where Sometimes if it is not contained, then you do need to somehow using the mesh and cable to create a containment for the bone graft. Okay. After creation of this particular mesh with cable uh, uh, containment, that's when you then can impact in the bone as such. Um, for the proximal impaction, putting in the graft, you realize that that's how we we continue to impact it away and uh, suck it off. Um, the surrounding bone has to be impacted even more vigorously. And uh, next, you then uh, put in the cement in your impacted graph that you have been created, which almost look like a nice femoral canal. And you cement in, pressurize your cement, and... Uh, Subsequently, wait for the correct moment to put in your cemented stem, okay? And then uh, hold it in place while waiting for the cement to set. Um, this is almost like doing uh, a primary cemented stem onto an intact femur with all the impaction bone graft surrounding it, okay? Um, this is a case where you do, I do, both the impaction bone grafting, both at the establum as well as the, the femur site. Um, eventually, it turned out to, uh, to be well incorporated. So the bone graft thing, does it work? We have many, 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 many studies out there. The long-term one, 540 hips, exodus, experience, uh, follow-up of 2 to 15 years, survivorship at 10 years of 84%. Um, there are actually many, many more um, evidence out there that you can see that shows femoral infection bone grafting does work. And um, this is a case of a 37-year-old lady. Dr. Chua, we need to conclude, please. Sure, sure. And um, that eventually, as you can see, it turned into bone. 
So in conclusion, impression bone grafting of the femur is a viable option in dealing with severe bone loss in femoral stem revision. Uh, IBG should be considered to replace lost bone, can be used in both contained and uncontained defect, and a good technique with help, uh, in, will help in the good outcomes. With that, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chua. Excellent exposition of a great technique. We move on to the next talk uh, by our dear friend, Dr. Fatih, and he's going to speak to us on modular versus monoblock stems. All yours. Hello. Uh, yeah, the screen is not very clear. We need to go on slideshow. Yes. Can you hear me? Is there any problem with the voice? No problem. No, okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, for giving this talk to me. I'm going to talk about the modular and the monoblock stems, but my presentation strategy will mainly focus on the modular ones. Um, so what is modularity? The modularity is everywhere in arthroplasty. It's not just focused on some uh, certain region, but our components are uh, almost always modular, especially when we're talking about the stem. Uh, the modularity is starting from the head to the tip. Uh, but this talk is mainly about the, the femoral side. So what's the um, advantage? What's the, um, why it's necessary? So, uh, it allows surgeon to 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 customize and build a, and and custom um, implant, and it better match to the patient needs and anatomy because maybe it may be a very very uh, different in one patient to the other, and it gives an intraoperative flexibility um, for for varying geometries and anatomies. Um, it gives um, um, uh, uh, flexibility in antiversion neck angle leg length and lateral offset or other other types of um, varying geometries. So when we're talking about the femoral uh, stem uh, um, modularity, um, the, the proximal and distal uh, femur can be planned independently based on the implants. And the indications are mainly rely on that. The metaphysial and the diaphysial mismatch is the main indication in this. But Osteotomy and the post trauma revisions are also some in prosthetic fractures are also the indications of the modular um, uh, stems. Um, so I would like to also talk about the contraindications or relative contraindications because they are not only they are not always um, um, useful. There are some points that we have to be very careful about. The modularity. Um, is not indicated when uh, when the proximal metaphysial bone is not uh, adequate, and if there is severe proximal uh, bone ecstasia, um, so it may it may result with some um, implant failures. And relative contraindication is the ETO because the proximally uh, it is it's not very rigid sometimes, and we have to be at least very careful when we're using it for it. Um, so what are the main drawbacks? The stem modularity always introduced additional interface, and this is the most important drawback because every interface causes um, repetitive bending and corrosion at the end. And mainly the male stem uh, uh, taper side is the weakest part of these implants, and it's uh, always subject to overload. And at the end, uh, the uh, implant failure because when you look at the micro micro uh, scale, it's not always the two two uh, side of the interface does not touch perfectly like this, but it's more likely the 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 one in the right side because in micro scale there are always hills and valleys uh, in in the material. So when when there is a micro emotion, even it goes with some um, corrosion. So there are a lot of tests done for that in various implant types when the the most weak part is as you can see the 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 taper uh, part and at the the at the end you may see some breakages or some wear uh if if it's not uh, used properly uh so how can we make the outcome better we have to have a distal diaphysial stability which is very important and adequate proximal bone sh should provide um, the, the rotational stability as well, and we should rely on the we should be able to rely on the proximal bone, bone stock, and in growth is so important. And the fixation uh, concept in, in, in selection of the implant in the regards to the fixation concept 
if there is effective LC integration in this distal part, but the, the proximal is missing, uh, it is all there's always significant bending stress in the implant in the in the taper junction. But if uh, we select for those cases a uh, more distal uh, junction, taper junction uh, designs, that may uh, alter the stress pattern so it's be better. In any case, we should have a distal, good distal fixation and the medial defects should be restored. So as a result, the better outcome uh, with, with more specific terms the the, the um, modularity is good for Paprosky type one, type two, and three A defects, which can uh, provide good distal and some to some extent the proximal um, um, bone support. But for TBs and for uh, type fours, it's not it's not it may not be a good um, um, choice. So in conclusion, we have to be aware of the surgical technique that's required for modularity uh, selection. And uh, we have to avoid the, the uh, necessary um, things. But as a result, as it uh, presents a lot of variability options in these designs, we have to make a good operator planning. It should not be go, go spontaneously during the surgery. Uh, so I think I'm at the end of the uh, presentation, so I will not continue with the cases. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fatih. And when stems do not meet the loading requirements of the hip, they break. And to talk to us by, will be Mrinal uh, on broken stems. Thank you, Abhay. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll be presenting on uh, broken stems. Can you see me? Yes, absolutely. Please go ahead. Fine. So why stems break? The uh, stem breakage almost is re indicated for revisions in almost 1% of the cases. And modular stems, they break even more. And up to 4% of revision surgeries are done due to breakage of the modular stems. Now, there are many reasons for the stems to break. It can be poor restoration of the biomechanics, cantilever principle working with the well-fixed distal stem and proximal stem shielding, mismatch between the models of elasticity of bone in the stem, especially some stems like the solution stem, they usually break very often. Fatigue failure, poor metallurgy, a uh, lot of modularity, they all contribute to stem failures. So the described techniques to, you know, uh, the revise these stems are the commonest one, which, you know, Dr. Manjari has already described ETO, which I'll be using in my case report as well. Other described techniques are using the uh, Trifine burrs, where you use uh, Trifine like a hollow mill. You can see the K-wire, which is uh, preventing the distal tip of the stem to migrate. And then it has been revised with the model, uh, with the uh, tapered fitting distal stem. Another technique used is where a stem has broken, where you use a ETO. And then uh, with a carbide burr, you make uh, indentation into the distal uh, part of the stem in the proximal part and the broken fragment. And then you hammer it out with something, uh, loosen it probably uh, across around with a pencil tip burr. Another technique which has been described here, uh, where the stem might be loose, you know, in some cases, uh, where you can hammer it out with a punch or a retrograde nail through the knee and the tip of this, uh, the distal tip can be punched out retrograde in a retrograde version manner a cortical window technique is often used by us for revision where the distal fitting the the cement or the pedestal is being hammered out with this uh, cortical but this uh, with this cortical window technique this is not a broken stem but a similar technique has been used which is called the modified sliding cortical window technique it is used for cemented stems the mantle remains untouched you can see the proximal fragment of the stem here is broken and they've just made a cortical window anteriorly they have slided the distal part of the stem out and the cement mantle is intact and it has been it has been revised with the cement in cement revision and the cortical window has been closed with the circlage wires. There's another technique called the Lancaster cortical window technique where a broken proximal stem, you can see here, uh, and a lateral window is made almost 100 millimeters from the tip of the greater trochanter. It is laterally placed and actually it uh, helps you to approach the tip of the stem and also the uh, cement plug distally. 
and you can just uh, you know remove the stem and push it out in a retrograde manner uh, so the case report i'm going to discuss here is a 77 year female index was written 12 years ago for a fractured neck of femur a thompson process was used she came with pain limp and shortening she had a cardiac problem for which her tavi was done and the esr crp were normal so these are her pre operative x rays you can see a thompson process which has been broken at the junction uh the distal stem seems to be well fixed and this is usually the case in such uh, scenario you have difficulty in exposure you have difficulty in access to the distal stem and there is a bone in growth you can see this is another case which i had revised uh, for a thompson process where the bone in grows into these uh, you know cavities in the stem itself and it's very difficult to access these you if if your if the collar is intact it's even more difficult so i went inside i did a posterior lateral approach and uh, i release uh, my cordyceps and the extensors uh, the abductors to a greater extent to aid in exposure and then i dislocated i could easily remove the proximal uh, head part of the prosthesis uh, this is the posterior lateral uh, you know the uh, the eto which i am performing the posterior window and then this on the right side is the anterior you know um, the limb of the eto which i have used uh, fine tip bar and a 2 mm drill bit make sure to you know round and bevel the margin so that your osteotomy this eto does not propagate and cause a stress riser or a fracture always use uh, you know once you mark this osteotomy you use a fine um, you know blade to complete your osteotomy and after that i used the osteotomes and beveled it and you know moved it anteriorly from the posterior approach and then with a flexible osteotome you can remove the stem which is fixed in the distal part and it was pretty easy once the bone had been removed all you know aside then i did reaming of the distal fragment under siam and did the trial and this is how i closed the i could see that i am able to close the osteotomy the eto and the stem was placed and you can see the stem is going inside in the correct version and it's been checked on the siam that it is having a good cortical 4 to 5 cm of isthmus fit distally and the osteotomy has been closed and i use a circlage wire in the distal part uh, beyond the osteotomy and at least two to three circlage wires or cables in the proximal part to close the osteotomy and make sure once you've reduced the stem and it's gone back you must tighten these again so just a revision of the eto what had been described by dr manjuri and this is the final uh, no, now we need to close and this is yeah and this is the final x ray so the take home message is that you must plan your case and you must have all the armamentarium ready for you with defines flexible osteotomes carbide burs giggly saw wires punches whatever is needed and with an eto you can easily put in a distal fitting wagner or restoration stem or a, a long stem like this and get away with such difficult cases uh, thank you Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mrinal, and can we uh, can share? Okay, so great, gentlemen. Thank you so much for some lovely talks. And one rule for an eight-minute discussion: we will do a couple of questions, and I wish I would request all of you to be very short and very precise. So, first question is uh, to Dr. Satish Kutte. Satish. with uh, so first question is to uh, as a show of hands to all the faculty on the femur side how many of you use the paprosky classification for femur defect classification just a show of hands so most of you uh, lewis uh, do you do something else you right. also do it so yeah. how many yeah. of you will change to a femur defect classification and i would request satish to do it have you shifted to it or uh, would you use it partly uh, partly uh, we just started uh, the started introducing in our in our mdts uh, so it's just happening so just a change over but we but we use both at the moment so one one quick answer to why have you changed from paprosky to human defect classification it's mainly what is the advantage uh, Uh, main, uh, mainly, mainly uh, th the amount of defects around the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter, which is uh, it is not being taken into account in the other classifications. So that's we're seeing more and more of that. So just to add a note in so our better MDT. quantification of peri uh, trochanteric defects, but still the proximal metaphyseal or the me metaphyseal yes. diaphyseal defects. So that's yes, the take defects. home for the audience, right? Yes. So you could use a femur defect for proximal defects, but paprosky remains the most favored method. Next question is Dr. Mojib sir 
when will you use an endofemoral removal for a revision situation or a cortical window? And what would be your threshold to convert uh, to a ETO? I have a very low threshold for ETO. TO and part of it is uh, is because of my training i mean if uh, where i did my fellowship they had a very low threshold and and in that unit ETO was the go to when you have a difficulty in taking the femoral component at the time of revision within the first few minutes uh, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to exhaust your options keep on passing with the flexible osteotome, come back and do an ETO, and at that point you'll find that either you're exhausted, you haven't done a proper planning, and you end up with a fracture of the fragment or a non-union of an ETO. So uh, my only an ETO, sir? What's that? Your bailout and your first choice will be an ETO. No, well, first choice, depending if I'm going with a, with a loose component, right, or a, or a cemented component that could be tapped out, then fine, no need for ETO. So but if you have passed it, ETO. So if you pass few flexible osteotomes on a on a on an on an uncemented uh, femoral component and you think that you're not getting anywhere, then instead of wasting time, I would rather go and do an ETO. So I would have planned for an ETO as my go-to uh, option for a removal of a well-fixed uncemented femoral component or a cemented component that I'm not able to remove or remove, but I need to go in and take the rest of the cement, particularly if I'm dealing with an infection case. Sure, sir. And now the only the only limitation here, and particularly in Asian patient population, is that you don't you don't want to go for an ETO when you think that you'll be jeopardizing your your fixation uh, segment in the isthmus of the femur. That's okay, the one great. thing that I'm very careful about. So if you think that you're dealing with a, a, a long stem that has been put in the past or you have a long cement mantle, then I would sh keep my osteotomy fragment short, like sh not shorter than 10, maybe something between 10 to 12 centimeter, do what uh, Myrna uh, uh, described by, you know, taking the femoral component either in full or pieces and then go in with, uh, with a device that I can use to remove the distal part of a transected femoral component or you take away that uh, cement mantle. Great, great, sir. So message is ETO, you have to pre-plan it, you have to anticipate it. You will not probably be able to do an endofemoral or a cortical window if you have a significant uh, defect or a specific indication. So very often, it is not the last option, but a go-to option. So my question, third question is to, uh, for Dr. Hashim. So very quick answer on, is there a definite way of knowing the cement mantle is intact? One, two, three, four, just pointers, sir, just pointers. What would you tell the audience? You, are un you need to unmute. How, what yes, take home um, message will you give the audience? Point one, two, three, four. Definite well, ways of knowing cement mantle is loose or intact. Yes, I mean, it, uh, you look at the the uh, x-rays, you have to <clears throat> uh, uh, be able to differentiate between uh, loosening at the bone cement uh, interface and the uh, uh, cancellation. So x-rays uh, is what, sir? And also operatively, of course, uh, you only have to uh, to to uh, uh, judge by trying to move the uh, so the per operative cement. mobility of the mantle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything I mean, else? The, and the soft tissue, of course. And these are the main uh, uh, way of of testing, really. So great. So the way of knowing cement mantle intact or loose or broken is pre-op evaluation, careful sequential pre-op evaluation, and per operative mobility of the mantle. Yes. Is that right, sir? So yeah, that's yeah. the take home for the audience. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, sir. So my next question is uh, is to both Fatih and uh, Dr. Chua. I'm giving you a situation, 70-year-old male with a type 3A, 3B, going for a second revision of the femur. Uh, in which condition, Dr. Fatih, will you consider an impaction bone grafting instead of your go-to uh, uh, go to modular stem? Is there a case where you will consider impaction bone grafting rather than your go-to modular uh, uh, or a monoblock stem? So if if the proximal proximal bone support is enough, if there is no a lot of bone uh, loss, uh, the modularity may be an option. But if if the proximally there is no enough support, very shortly, I can say uh, the 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 option may be uh, bone impaction. So you're saying essentially that if you have a type 2 or a 3A Proprosky, your go-to will be a modular stem. Otherwise, if you've got anything more than 3B or a plus minus 3A, 
your go-to will be impaction bone grafting and a cemented femur. Is that exactly. right? Summary. Perfect. And Dr. Chua, when will you consider doing a monoblock stem instead of your go-to uh, uh, impaction bone grafting for the femur and a cemented stem? Dr. Uh, Chua he, is not here. He is not here. He had to leave. Oh, okay. So, has a logistic problem. So, so like any, would any of the uh, uh, the faculty take that question? Uh, any takers for uh, those who do impaction bone grafting for the femur? When would they convert to a modular or a monoblock stem? May I request uh, Satish? A word. Uh, I, I I don't do impaction bone grafting because it's a very technique dependent uh, procedure, and I uh, and I have struggled before, so I would move away from that. So if I have to, I would probably use a distal locking type of stem. Uh, or uh, if the proximal femur is completely gone, then you have no choice, then you, you have to end up with a proximal femur oh, replacement. Oliver Great. can add. Oliver, any yeah. takes on that? To be honest, I, I my opinion is the same as Satish. I mean, I use acetabular side, who is very simple to do it. But for the femoral side, it's so complex to do it correctly that uh, that I think is, is not my, my first option, only in very, very special cases. And, and my opinion is the same as Satish. I use this oh. is monoblock uh, distal. And blocking. it's important for in that. In, in, yeah, you're you're right. Can, can I say, say something? Yeah, yeah sure, 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 Right, it's One very different question. in femur. Acetabular side, I think it's if it's not contained in femoral side, it's very difficult to have a good result at the end of the uh, IBG. Great point. Uh, so I think we are coming to the close of the discussion time. Is that right, Oliver? Or do we have some time? You have one I minute for what? One, yes, one comment. Uh, Sahid, there is a comment from Sahid. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it has been a wonderful uh, webinar. And thank you, uh, Sikor. Uh, my advice for all the audience is that it's a difficult thing. And one of the important things is extensile exposure. And once you learn it, as Mujib has said about eccentric uh, trochanteric osteotomy, and in the knee, I do tibial tubercle osteotomy. It makes your life so easy that you love it. It reduces the time and there are no contraindication. So you do close it completely. So people who are into revision must learn this technique by somebody who's doing it regularly. And then fixation and implant is, again, uh, we have had many cupcage construction and uh, distraction. It is not the textbook. It is not the webinar. It is a short fellowship that you have to go to a center, learn the technique, and then apply. Otherwise, the rate of failure of revision surgeries are very, very high, and there is going to be hydrogenic catastrophic failure. Thank you so much, sir. So just to quickly uh, give you pointers, the audience pointers for the summary for what our speakers have just said. So when you're talking of femur defects in revision situations, you're essentially looking at one, location of the defect, Two, you are looking at the quantification of the defect. Three, you are looking at the residual isthmus for your fixation possibilities. If you've got good cement mantle with a, a more than a 3A or a 3B defect, uh, if you've got a good cement mantle, you can go for a cement and cement revision. Implant removal are uh, multiple techniques. You can go endofemoral or cortical window, but your go-to and a lot of pre-planning will need you to go to an ETO and you need to do a correct ETO because it's postromedial. If you go anteromedial, that becomes a Wagner. The next important thing is you have a 3B defect or worse or a borderline 3 a defect. You can consider impaction bone grafting, but it is a very labor intensive, very technique dependent uh, technique. You've got to have the right instruments. But the, the good side is you have a primary uh, situation when you need to revise that femur. So that's a great, ad uh, a great uh, uh, possibility in terms of revision. In terms of fixation, you can use a modular or a monoblock stem. Modular stems have a cone taper junction failure incidence, especially the male part uh, because of fretting corrosion. The monoblock stems are great stems to use. A lot of people use monoblock stems, but the problem is they, have, they undergo subsidence. And uh, if you have a failure for a modular stem, the failure is usually at the uh, cone stem taper junction. So if you need to do a revision, you need to choose your optimal implant at, to give a stable, well-balanced hip with correction of version, offset, and limb blend discrepancy to have a, a marriage of a stem to a properly placed acetabular component. Thank you for your time.
over thank to you, you Oliver. Yeah, thank you everyone for uh, your participation, your collaboration, and thank you to the audience for being there. As always, hundreds of people are connected live to this Secret Pioneer HIP uh, webinar. And uh, Goes mentioned that there are 13 uh, webinars from Secret Pioneer this year. Half of, of them are from HIP uh, committee. And this is the last one that we will have next month with the American Association for HIP and Knee Society. So I would like to thank you, all of you, especially uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, HIP Society and his president. Thank you so much for being here and for the great support to this webinar. Hope to see you all in Cairo. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank Bye you guys. so much, all faculty. Thank, thank you, you Shahid, sir. Thank you, thank Oliver. You. Thank, thank you, Mina.